Welcome to House of Words, a podcast about writers, artists, and the controversial. I am your host, Jason Lemoore Hardin, and today we are exploring a director, writer, and author who goes by many names, the Sultan of Sleaze, the Baron of Bad Taste, the Pope of Trash, the Duke of Dirt, the Prince of Puke, none other than John Waters. Quote, to me, bad taste is what entertainment is all about. If someone vomits watching one of my films, it's like getting a standing ovation. But one must remember that there is such a thing as good bad taste and bad bad taste. It's easy to disgust someone. I could make a 90-minute film of people getting their limbs hacked off, but this would only be bad bad taste and not very stylish or original. To understand bad taste, one must have very good taste. Good bad taste can be creatively nauseating, but must, at the same time, appeal to the especially twisted sense of humor, which is anything but universal." End quote. John Waters was born in 1946 in Baltimore, Maryland, and spent his youth in the nearby suburb of Lutherville with his brothers Steve and two sisters, Kathy and Patricia. They were what Waters would later refer to as upper-middle-class Roman Catholics. Already as a young boy, John had a curious appetite for the macabre and would stage accidents with his toys. He even talked his parents into taking him to junkyards where he could explore real wrecks. He fondly recalls the golden moment when he found real blood on the front seat of a smashed-up car and wondered if anyone had died in it. He was sent to secular private school as a child, but to a Catholic high school. At the religious school, he discovered the roots to what would become some of his favorite obsessive compulsions when the nuns inadvertently introduced him to the world of taboo films. Each week, the nuns would produce a list of films which were considered unacceptable by the church. Needless to say, this gave young John a list of movies he simply had to watch. Soon, he made a habit of cutting class and sneaking downtown to see the sleazy films that made up the forbidden lists. These were nudist camp films, foreign sex films, low-budget horror films, and -and slice-and-dice masterpieces by those who would become his favorite filmmakers, Russ Meyer, William Castle, and the Kuchar brothers. The nuns also inspired his love of literature, though again inadvertently steering him towards subject matters opposite to what they intended. Tennessee Williams, in particular, became an obsession after the nuns told Waters that anyone who'd watch the Tennessee Williams written film, Baby Doll, would go to hell. Hoping to one day own a dirty movie theater, he fantasized about showing Baby Doll for the rest of his life. Now, Tennessee Williams would later on play an even more important role in his life. When John went to a gay bar for the first time at age 17, he discovered it filled with 1960s gay men in fluffy sweaters who cruised one another by calling table to table on phones provided by the bar. I may be queer, but I ain't this, he thought. Like Tennessee, he never seemed to fit the gay stereotype. One can say that the sex lives of his characters weren't always healthy, but they sure were hearty. In essence, Tennessee Williams gave Waters the confidence to not be a gay cliché and made it understood that he could be anything he wanted to be. The Wicked Witch of the West was a big influence on Waters' childhood, and he's revealed that the only time he's ever been in drag was when he dressed up as the witch for a children's birthday party. Adults raised their eyebrows upon seeing the young boy dressed up as a witch, but it wasn't so much that Waters wanted to wear a dress, rather it was a desire to have green skin. He remembers sitting in the theater watching The Wizard of Oz, unable to understand why Dorothy wanted to return home to what he considered was an awful black and white farm with the aunt who dressed badly with smelly farm animals around, when she could live around with winged monkeys and magic shoes and gay lions. When Dorothy clicked her heels together, 
Waters was the only child at the theater, sobbing. Another of his pre-adolescent role models was Rhoda Penmark, the murderous little blonde pigtailed girl in the smocked dress from the 1954 film The Bad Seed. He loved actress Patty McCormick's performance as the character, and she soon became his next obsession. He wanted to be feared like Rhoda and felt the urge to yell out the movie's ad campaign, The Bad Seed is the Big Shocker, to clueless grade school classmates. Young John was so consumed by Rhoda that when in the film, the hateful janitor tells Rhoda that she'll be electrocuted in a little pink electric chair they reserve for little girls, he was ready to jump in Rhoda's lap and feel the sizzle along with her. Now, the only male figure he looked up to during childhood and who made up the trio of his early negative influences was Captain Hook. Trying to be encouraging parents, they allowed their son to wear a coat hanger up his sleeve for about a year under the condition that he wouldn't wear it around the dinner table. When he wanted to have long hair like Captain Hook's, not having a wig, he would tape his father's ties to his head with rolls and rolls of scotch tape. His cleaning lady at the time discovered the youngster with the ties on his head and ran from the house and quit. Now, this made him feel more like Captain Hook as he pretended that he made her walk the plank. In his late teens, he discovered the world he had been looking for in the shape of a downtown Baltimore bar called Martix. The crowd there was very mixed and eclectic, with bohemians, beatniks, and drag queens, among others. These were the type of people he had only read about in William S. Burroughs, John Reshi, and Tennessee Williams novels. He was immediately hooked and soon decided to become a beatnik. He grew his hair long and wore faded jeans and spent most of his time getting into trouble with his friend, Bonnie. Bonnie would bleach her hair, crash parties, and steal liquor. Their reputation grew so bad that Bonnie's parents forbade her to see John. This was, however, not a deterrent for long, as Bonnie would make phony dates with normal boys, only to run off with John as soon as she got out of her parents' sight, a ruse which would later be used in his film Polyester from 1981. Mona Montgomery, his girlfriend before he came out as gay, was another hell-raising partner of his. They became an expert shoplifting team and often ran away together for weekends in New York City, where they would watch underground films and explore the downtown scene. And when John's grandmother bought him an 8 millimeter camera, Mona stole enough black-and-white film stock for him to make his first movie, Hag in a Black Leather Jacket. Now, according to him, the 15-minute short film cost about $30 to make and was shown only once publicly. This at a local coffee house. 1964 was the year John Waters dropped acid for the first time, but soon he would be dropping acid during school hours. He was enrolled at New York University Film School during this time. His enrollment was just an excuse to move to New York to watch movies and live the beatnik life. He attended one class and spent the rest of his time there living at the dorm and watching movies every day. After a few months, he was expelled for marijuana use and returned to Baltimore, but New York, and in particular the films he'd watched while there, made him realize that he wanted to make a career as a filmmaker. It led him to realize that his crazy ideas belonged somewhere and that people were actually into weird movies. Most of all, New York made him recognize that it was indeed possible to make a career of it. Now, during the creation of his early movies, Roman Candles and Mondo Trasho, he had various jobs, one of which was for a famous survey company. In a turn of events, this experience would help him develop and create characters. The work entailed going door to door, giving people a magazine with fake ads, then coming back the next day and asking them questions for two and a half hours about what they remembered seeing in the magazines. His appearance was a problem, however. Looking the way he did, with his long hair and beatnik style of clothing, no one would ever let him into their house. So, in order to earn his paycheck, he made up the answers, and in order to avoid being caught, he would have to make up characters. 
dozens of characters, which would considerably help later with his script writing. In his book, Shock Value, he noted how, in the late 60s, he felt like a fish out of water. As the rest of his generation were consumed by the idea of peace and love, Waters stood back, puzzled, and fantasized about the beginning of the hate generation. Woodstock 1969 was the final straw for the young filmmaker, seeing naked hippies rolling around in the mud as they and their illegitimate children grooved to Joan Baez hardly seemed like his idea of a good time. Violence, he felt, was his generation's sacrilege, so he decided to make a movie that glorified carnage and mayhem for laughs. This would become his first full feature, Multiple Maniacs. Now, when it comes to writing and concepts, John insists that what drives his work is and has always been the notion of what would make me and my friends laugh today. Although he wishes that plots would come to him whenever he wants them to, it doesn't. His preferred time of writing is between 7 in the morning and noon most days. That's when the inspiration comes to him most often. He listens to a lot of music, and when the inspiration does strike, it's the characters who come first and are the ones that drive the story forward. Then it's all about placing the characters in a particular scenario, some situation that he thinks will be interesting. Usually the plot revolves around some phenomenon that makes him laugh. Then he starts making notes, this idea here, this joke, this thing, this character, this, 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 pages and pages and pages of notes. Then he goes through it all and makes an outline. He always has to have the exact kind of legal pads from Towson Stationery as they made the brand he most liked. To write, he uses big pens with black ink and a red big to circle the ideas he likes most. He also has a red pencil that he uses to circle the ideas he likes more than the ones only circled in red pen. He usually makes a whole book of potential titles, a whole book of casting, and a whole book of who the characters are and what happens with them in the first, second, and third acts, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Without exception, he structures his movies the same way, always starting with the title, then the character, then the plot. He repeatedly uses a similar theme. There is always some kind of war between two groups of people. The people who win are happy with their neurosis. The people who lose are unhappy with them. The heroes generally lose something in the second act and get it back in the third. To quote Waters, that's the way every movie is. They're conventional on that level. Furthermore, he consistently does a load of research for his movies, utilizing two different research techniques. When researching a film, he goes to libraries and does extensive research and such. Also, he conducts so-called general life research, which includes going to sleazy bars, beauty parlors and such to explore the world and the characters he's creating. As usual, let me leave you with one final quote from the master of sleaze himself. I've always tried to please and satisfy an audience that thinks they've seen everything. I try to force them to laugh at their own ability to still be shocked by something. This reaction has always been the reason I make movies. I hate message movies and pride myself on the fact that my work has no socially redeeming value. I like to think I make American comedies." End quote. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemoa Harden. We here at House of Words ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash houseofwords or paypal.me slash houseofwordspodcast. Alternatively, you can subscribe and encourage others to subscribe to our YouTube page, House of Words Podcast. Every little bit helps more than you might think. Until next time. Keep turning those pages. House of 
House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason M. Moorharden. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason M. Moorharden. <laughs>